Good morning, saints of God, and welcome once again to our virtual Sunday school class. It's so good to be with you all today. Thank you so much for your patience as we go through this pandemic. Thank you so much for your faithfulness for joining us every Sunday morning. And happy 4th of July or happy Independence Day. God is so good. And while we're grateful for this Independence Day, we're even more grateful for the independence that we have in Christ Jesus, who freed us from the bondage of sin. And we just thank and praise God for that. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, it's once more again we come before you with thanksgiving in our hearts. God, we thank you for life, health, and strength. We thank you that you're our Father and we're your children, and your word declares that we can cast our cares on you because you love us and you care for us. You are a great God. You are a holy God. You are an awesome God. And you are a mighty God. You are the God whose steadfast love never ceases. And we thank you, God, not for what you've done, not even what you're going to do, but simply because you're God. God, we thank you for this day, a beautiful day, one we've never seen before and will never see again. God, we thank you for the lesson that we're going to have today, an attitude of gratitude. Oh, we are so grateful for all that you have done, all you are doing and all you're yet going to do. Help us, God, to remember to have grateful hearts because you didn't have to do any of it, but you loved us so much that you did. God, as always, we ask that you bless this place called Bethel, the house of God. Bless our leaders, Pastor Tony and Lady Tara, all of the leaders, all of the members here. God, continue to work your will in our lives. Continue to help us be the church that you are looking for in these last and evil days. And God, as we delve into the lesson, we ask that you let my words be your words and my thoughts your thoughts. God, let me not be Geraldine, but be who you want me to be. God, hide me behind the cross so the people would see none of me, but all of you. And as always, God, I ask you, God, to let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. For Lord, you are my strength and my redeemer. For it's in Jesus' name we do pray and ask it all. Amen and amen. Today we have Bible study guide number five for July 4th, 2021. And the subject of our lesson is an attitude of gratitude that will preach all by itself. If we didn't have any notes, if we didn't have any scriptures, we could work this subject all by itself because it's nothing like being thankful for all that God has done for us. Our Bible background comes from Leviticus, the 13th and the 14th chapters our, and Luke, the 5th chapter, 12th through the 16th verse. 17th chapter, 11th through the 19th verse. Our printed text, Leviticus 13th chapter, 45th through the 46th verses. Luke 17th chapter, 11th through the 19th verses. And our devotional reading comes from Isaiah 56th chapter, verses 1 through 8. And as always, we encourage you to read that at your leisure. Our aim for change. By the end of this lesson, we will explore reasons only one of 10 hill leopards turned back to Jesus in thanksgiving. Sense the need in our lives for increased expressions of gratitude to God and develop a plan for showing thanksgiving to God and others on a daily basis. Our scripture to keep in mind. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back with a loud voice, glorified God. Luke 17, chapter verse 15. Our in focus. Diane listened to the soloist at her church sing my tribute by Andre Crouch and began to weep. Her 30th birthday was Monday, and she reviewed all the major events of her life. Diane grew up taking care of her mother until cancer finally took her life. Diane, at the tender age of 15, held her mother's body until she breathed her last breath. Diane married out of high school and got pregnant right away. Soon she watched her three-day-old infant die in her arms from a rare disease attacking the child's heart. Her young husband, George, struggled with the baby's death and ended up on medication for depression. Several times, Diane spent long days sitting with him in the mental health facility after he had threatened suicide. Eventually, he got his medication regulated and slowly recovered. But it had been a long, hard road. Diane delivered two more children, but at the end of her last pregnancy, her doctor discovered a tumor in her breast. She had gone through the surgery and chemotherapy, now considering herself a cancer survivor in remission for five years. To God be the glory. The song spoke to her heart. She had been through so many difficult challenges in life, and she was thankful that God carried her through. 
God has done so much for us and gratitude is the best response. What are you thankful for right now? Oh my goodness, oh my goodness. As I read this, my mind went back and I started to reflect on all of the trials and the tribulations that I've been through, all of the hard times, all of the times that were dark and just seemed like there was no light anywhere. And then I look at where I am now and how God has brought me, how he has blessed me, how he has prospered me, how he has favored me. Oh my goodness. And I can't help but have an attitude of gratitude. That's why I praise him like I do. That's why I honor him like I do. That's why I try to be as faithful as I can because God has been so good to me. And I promised myself I wasn't going to get emotional with this lesson. But when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me, my soul cries out hallelujah because I thank God for saving me. He's been a good God to me and I bless him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Glory, God. I gave you glory. Yes, God. Yes, God. Oh, God, I thank you. Our scripture lesson, Leviticus 13 and 45. And the leper in whom the plague is, his clothes shall be rent and his head bare. And he shall put a covering upon his upper lip and shall cry unclean, unclean. And all the days wherein the plague shall be in him, he shall be defiled. He is unclean. He shall dwell alone without the camp shall his habitation be. Luke 17, starting at verse 11. And it came to pass as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were leopards, which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves unto the priest. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? There are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. Verse 19 says, and he said unto him, arise, go thy way. Thy faith has made thee whole. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. This this scripture, this lesson has just blessed my soul. So y'all bear with me. I'm gonna try to get through this without being too emotional. But God is such a good God. In verses 45 and 46. Even without knowledge of germ theory, <coughs> excuse me, and contagious diseases, the Israelites could practice these laws for the treatment of a leper and be fairly safe from the contagion. The plague referred to here is not the bubonic plague or black death, but a general word for infection of leprosy. After a detailed and rigorous inspection and waiting period to determine if a patient truly has leprosy, the priests are instructed as to what measures to take. To keep the contagion from spreading, the lepers would tear their clothes and burn them if they showed signs of infection too. Shave their head, which made it easier to track the spread of the disease on the scalp. Cover their mouths to prevent spread by coughing or sneezing. And issue an audible warning so others can stay away. The leper would also be quarantined outside of the camp, away from dense populations. The ancient Israelites did not see these steps as precautions against germs. However, they saw them as a way to prevent becoming unclean or undefiled. And they weren't used to, you know, germs and how germs could spread and scientific facts about that. They were just worried about becoming unclean. <coughs> <clears throat> excuse me, or defiled. It is hard to overestimate the fear the people of Israel had of leprosy or the sorrow of a family member or friend being diagnosed as a leper. Describing this disease as a plague suggests that it was considered a divine affliction. Incurable sin diseases led to a state of perpetual mourning for one's lost life. 
adding to the trauma, this uncleanness prevented persons with leprosy from participating in any of the communal religious activities of feasts. When I read this, I thought about the time when we found out about HIV. There were so many myths, so many misnomers, so many untrue statements that were going around about it that we were petrified with fear that we would catch it from somebody. So as a result, if somebody we knew had AIDS and sat in a chair, we didn't want to sit in that chair. If somebody drank out of a water fountain, we weren't drinking out of that water fountain. But it was not until we became educated that we found out about the spread of HIV. It comes from fluids, bodily fluids, from the vagina, a man's semen, contaminated blood. So we can sort of imagine what these people were feeling like when it came to leprosy. As the Israelites settled into the promised land, the places of quarantine were outside the villages. Those afflicted with leprosy suffered not only from the illness itself, but also from being ostracized socially. This meant no participation in weddings, funerals, synagogue meetings, and certainly not temple activities. You know how we felt when the pandemic came? We could not visit our loved ones. We could not go to weddings. We could not go to funerals. Or if we went, we were very cautious. There were only limited people there. I had two family members to die. My sisters who lived in Las Vegas could not come because they had to fly. And it, 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 it was just so depressing not to be able to interact with your family and together for joyous occasions. And this is how it was when you were a leopard. The afflicted persons depended on the kindness and provisions of family members or friends for survival. While medical conditions presenting as skin diseases were not immediately fatal, their resulting exclusions likely caused lives to be shortened by misery. When you are miserable like that, when you are cut off from people like that, it has an effect on your mental state. It has an effect on your attitude and your wanting to live. So this was something serious. So verse 11, it says, and it came to pass as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. The bulk of today's lesson comes from Jesus' final journey to Jerusalem. He chose a route that crossed areas where Samaritans might be encountered through the central part of Palestine. This route began in Galilee and moved south through the region of Samaria. On a map, it is easy to see that the shortest route from a town in Galilee to Jerusalem is Judea, and it would take them through Samaria. But Galilean Jews usually made the trip by the Jordan River Valley, a longer route in order to avoid Samaria because they didn't want to be around the Samaritans. As Jesus traveled, he was in a transitional era be between Samaritan and Jewish settlements. Verse 12 says, and as he entered into a certain village, there met him 10 men that were lepers, which stood afar off. The social isolation and physical pain of having leprosy probably resulted in more relationships between afflicted Jews and Samaritans than would be the case otherwise. Jews and Samaritans did not get along. They did not fellowship together. They did not go near each other. But in this case, there was no, they, they, they had no choice because if you had leprosy, you were outside of the camp. So everybody were together, the Jews and the Samaritans. As Jesus reached the edge of a certain village, a band of 10 men that were lepers who lived banished lives were ready to meet him. We are not told if this village was Jewish or Samaritan, so it may have been either. The fact that the men stood afar off was in compliance with the law of Moses. Probably stayed near the village where some of them may have had family members who provided food and clothing. These men were helpless. They couldn't go get food. They couldn't go get clothing. So they had to depend on their family members to supply them with what they needed. Those afflicted with leprosy who ignored the expectation of maintaining proper distance might be driven away by having rocks thrown at them by fearful people. If they got too close to people, people would throw rocks at them.
so they wouldn't get near them. So this was a horrible way to live. This was a horrible way of life. Verse 13 says, and they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. The lepers did not presume to approach Jesus, choosing instead to shout at him from a distance. They addressed Jesus as master rather than rabbi or Lord. These are terms of respect and deference, primarily found on the lips of Jesus' disciples. It's used by the men with leprosy implies some existing knowledge of Jesus. The author gives the impression that they shouted in unison, indicating a plan formulated before Jesus' visit. Somehow or another, they had heard that Jesus would be coming by. So they had a plan. They said, we've heard about this man. We know this man is a healer. So we're going to get his attention. We're going to do whatever we can to get him to notice us. These men are not recorded as having cried out the required unclean. The focus rather is on their plea for mercy, divine favor. In the case at hand, such mercy would entail God's healing. Requests for God's mercy occur frequently in the Psalms. When you are desperate for healing, when you are desperate for anything, you will do what you have to do to get the attention that you need. And this is what these lepers did. These men with leprosy saw Jesus as a conduit of God's grace and mercy. They apparently had heard of Jesus' ministry of healing the sick. Such healing had already included cases of leprosy. Friends or relatives who provided for these men likely had shared the stories they heard about Jesus. And I'm sure these men had the attitude that if he healed them, then he can heal me. The word of God says God is not a respect of persons. What he does for one, he'll do for another. The preparedness of this band of desperate men indicates that Jesus' arrival at this particular village was expected and eagerly anticipated. And you know what? We need to eagerly anticipate the presence of Jesus. When we come to church, we ought to anticipate his presence. We ought to anticipate the word that we're going to have. We ought to anticipate the deliverance that we are seeking because Jesus is near. Verse 14 says, and when he saw them, he said unto them, go show yourselves unto the priests. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. Jesus' immediate response was not to heal the men, but to command an act that required faith. To be recognized as cleansed, they needed to be certified by a priest. Jesus instructed them to seek such certification before they were healed. Though he spoke as though it had already been accomplished. The nearest priest might have been living in the village since priests who were from the tribe of Levi had no fixed territory in Israel or Samaria. The text indicates that the ten men with leprosy were not healed until they began to make their way to priests as Jesus commanded. No healing took place until they were obedient to the instruction Jesus gave them. Obedience is the key. The men were thus rendered clean and free of disease when they obeyed in faith. We assume the fact that they were clean means that all visible and invisible manifestations of their affliction disappeared. How that had become unnaturally white returned to its natural color. The, the, the skin began to brighten. The sores began to disappear. I can imagine them looking at themselves as they were walking and saying, we really are healed. We are being healed. And I can imagine the excitement and the enthusiasm they had as they made their way to the priest. The men thus realized that their trip to the priest was not a fool's errand, but rather the first step in reclaiming their lives. They would be able to resume their roles in family and village life. This was an, an exciting time for them. They realized they would be able to live a normal life, to interact with their family and friends. A simple lesson here is that faith that resulted in obedience led to healing. For the 10 men of our text, this was physical healing. For us, it may be spiritual healing, a cleansing of our unclean hearts when we obediently follow Jesus. Verses 15 and 16 says, And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back with a loud voice, glorified God, and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. One man's heart drove him to respond in ways that are not attributed to the other nine. First, he delayed his trip to a, a priest as he turned back to Jesus. The man's burning desire to be declared clean by a priest was trumped by his desire to show gratitude. He wanted to be made clean. 
He wanted to be healed. But the fact that he was being healed trumped his desire to go to the priest for certification. He wanted to go back and thank the man who healed him. Second, in his loudest voice, he glorified God. His words are not recorded, but we can imagine something like our familiar, to God be the glory. Great things he has done. Third, the man fell down at Jesus' feet, which was the extreme posture of submission. The context indicated a posture appropriate only for worshiping God. The man's mourning for his wretched state was transformed into spontaneous praise for the one who brought God's healing to him as he gave thanks to Jesus. A lot of times when, when God does something for us, we get so caught up in the blessing that we forget about the blesser. And I'm going to say that one more time. Sometimes when God does something miraculous for us, we get so caught up in the blessing that we forget about the blesser. But this man didn't forget about the one who blessed him. All this was the man's instinctive reaction to having been shown mercy. He may not have understood everything that just happened, but one thing he knew, Jesus had been God's instrument in his healing. This man had been shown the mercy requested. What is your response to, to your request to a prayer? What is your response when you are healed? What is your response when you're brought out of prop, uh, poverty? What is your response when you've been forgiven? What is your response? Is it to forget about the blesser and just worship the blessing? We need to think about that. Putting these facts together helps us understand the nature of worship. We glorify God for who he is, extolling his revealed attributes, his transcendent holiness, his mercy, his long suffering, his patience, his grace. We thank God for what he has done in providing the blessings we personally enjoy. Luke reveals the shocking plot twist that the one who thought it more important to return to Jesus before seeing a priest was a Samaritan. The hated Samaritan was the one who came back. We assume that the man could be identified this way by some distinctive trait. Perhaps his accent gave him away, or maybe it was the precise words he used to glorify God. Distinctive clothing is another possibility. The irony here is similar to that of the, the, the Jew that was beaten and left to die on the road and, and, and the priest came by and the Levite came by and none of them helped him. They crossed to the other side. But the Samaritan tended to his wounds, put him on his beast and took him to uh, an inn and paid for his stay there until he came back. You know what? You can't judge people by their titles. You can't judge people by their reputation. You can't judge people by what other people say. Because sometimes the very people you judge, the very people you look down on, the very people you ignore will be the ones God has to tend to you. Verse 17 says, and Jesus answered, said, were there not ten cleansed, but where are the nine? Verse 18, there are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. Jesus' questions was rhetorical. He didn't expect an answer from this man. It was not to be answered literally, but rather meant to grab the attention of those within earshot. Because you know there were spectators along the way. There were spectators who saw what was going on. The response sought was one of self-reflection, not one of determining the latitude or longitude location of the absent nine who were also healed. It wasn't asking, it, it was not intended to say, how far have they, have they gone? Have they reached the priest yet? This is just something Jesus asked to make them think. And Jesus' questions to serve the same function today as it rings in our ears. Why did only one of the ten pause to first praise God and thank Jesus? When we are blessed, are we more like the one or the other nine? Are we more like the one or the other nine? Jesus' healing miracles always function to serve a larger purpose than merely be being nice to someone. Miracles serve as teaching opportunities. Miracles serve as teaching opportunities. Jesus doesn't heal just to heal. He doesn't perform members, miracles just to perform miracles, but there are teaching opportunities in everything that he does. After another curiosity is that the one who did come back was of all people a non-Jew, a stranger, who of all people should have accepted Jesus and his mission. In the end, 
relationship with God is demonstrated by one's faith, not by one's ancestral connections. You would have thought that the Jews would have been the first to come back and to worship and to say thank you, but they didn't. After posing his rhetorical questions for all to hear, Jesus turned to the Samaritan to address him personally. All the men were healed by faith, but only this singular Samaritan received the affirmation that faith has made thee whole. Not only was he whole, not only was he healed, but he was made whole. Everything that was wrong, any sins he had committed, everything that he lacked was given to him because he gave thanks. You wonder why some people maybe get healed, but still aren't whole? Because they didn't give thank thanks. Because they weren't grateful. Because they just took it for granted. I'm telling you, when you give thanks, when you have an attitude of gratitude, your life will be so much better. Things will just naturally open up for you. And you can live life at its fullest. It does not mean that the power of his personal faith in and of itself brought about the healing. It means rather that the man's trust and expectation in God, as demonstrated by his initial act of obedience to seek out the priest, was pleasing to God, by whose power the leprosy was vanquished. The word rendered made whole is often translated saved, as I said. The good news about Jesus was already moving beyond the confines of Judaism. The news of Jesus was not limited to a Jewish audience, although there were initially a certain sequence in terms of evangelism priority. Jesus came to save the Jews first, and then it was spread abroad. But in this case, Jesus didn't seek out the leper. The leper seeked out him. And because he seeked him out, Jesus wasn't going to ignore that. He healed him and he made him whole. It didn't matter that he wasn't a Jew. What mattered was his faith, his obedience, and his attitude. Listen, y'all, in prayer, when you begin to pray and you begin to thank God, and when you start to thank God, your mind goes back. And you begin to think about all the things that he's done for you. And you, when you begin to think about all he's done for you, then you begin to go into a praise. And when that praise gets so loud and so audible and so good, then you automatically go into worship. That's how you get your blessing from prayer to thinking, to thinking, to praise then to worship. I just told y'all something that'll help you. I hope you think about that. Gratitude, an attitude of gratitude. Life doesn't get much worse than the faith of a person with leprosy in Jesus' day. Excluded from the community, required to be self-degrading in word and appearance, destined to live with a slowly fatal and painful disease. It was a living death, yet a heart of thankfulness survived in a Samaritan leper. He remains a worthy example of the biblical way to worship. He overcame the urgencies of life to stop, turn around, and look at Jesus without being distracted. He let praise for God well up from his heart and be expressed in his words. He overcame tunnel vision of what's next to adopt a worshipful posture. He gave thanks to the one who had healed him, claiming no credit for himself. Woo! Woo! This is so good. Somebody ought to grab a hold of this. God does not need our thanks, but he crea created us as beings who need to give thanks. The unthankful life can become bitter and cold. You wonder why sometimes people are so bitter, people are so hateful, people are just so down and out because they don't have a heart of thanksgiving, because they don't know how to be thankful for all the blessings, all the things that God has blessed us with. The thankful heart will find peace and purpose in all circumstances. May we learn from the man who returned that even in the humblest of circumstances, there is nothing to prevent us from praise and thanks to God. Nothing except our own selfish and stubborn hearts. May we recognize our spiritual poverty, ask for God's mercy and praise and thanks when it arrives. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Woo. This is so good. Our application for activation. We, are, we see daily how much easier it is to complain than give thanks. Aggravation, loneliness, anger, and stress all cause us to whine and complain instead of being grateful. The media stirs up an attitude of wanting more and being discontent. 
The negative attitudes are a result of ignoring God and not acknowledging him as a source of all our possessions and well-beings. Y'all, where we are, God brought us. What we know, he taught us. What, he have, what we have, he gave us. And who we are, he made us. Read Psalms 100, verses 4 and 5. Sometime this week, make up a prayer, song, poem, praise dance, or something created based on these verses and the lesson. Share it with a member of your family, friend, or co-worker, and ask them to be an accountability person. When you start complaining, tell them to remind you of your creative piece and your desire to be more grateful. This past Sunday when Pastor spoke at First Baptist, he was saying words have power. And instead of complaining, we need to be grateful. Instead of talking about how bad you are hurting, begin to thank God for your healing. Instead of talking about going to the poor house, begin to thank God that your house is blessed and you're prosperous. Instead of complaining about people who don't like you, thank God for the friends that you have in your life. Y'all, we ought to be grateful because God doesn't owe us all of this. And I'm grateful and I thank him for every blessing, not the big, not the small, but all in between every blessing. I am so grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This was a great lesson. I got a little carried away. The enemy came in at first coughing and wheezing and trying to catch my breath. But thank God his healing power came in and I was able to do this lesson. Enjoy this beautiful Sunday with your family, with your friends as we celebrate the 4th of July. And remember, always remember, you're braver than you believe. You're stronger than you seem and you're smarter than you think. Remember, God loves you, and so do I. Be blessed.